Hello, fifth graders, and welcome to another ELA lesson with me, Miss Mooney. I'm so excited to start this week with you, and I'm especially excited because we're going to be starting a new novel together this week, as well as learning a couple new vocabulary words and just doing some really fun lessons. So let's go ahead and get started with today's. So today our main idea is characterization. So that might be a new word for you, maybe something that you've heard in the past, um, but either way, don't worry, we're gonna be defining what that word means soon and then also practicing it by reading our book. So our objective for today is that I can describe the geographical setting of Esperanza Rising. So that gives you a hint that Esperanza Rising is going to be the new novel we're starting. So if you can just start today by getting your ELA notebook ready and a pencil or a pen or anything else to write with, as well as a clean workspace, then we can get started. So if you have to pause, feel free to do so so you can go get your materials and then come back when you're ready. All right, so we're gonna be starting with reviewing just a couple vocabulary words. So some of these might be ones you've heard in the past or that you've done in school already, but we're just gonna do a quick review so that we're all on the same page for the lesson. So setting. The place or type of surroundings where something is positioned or where an event takes place. So the first part of that definition says when some where something is positioned. So that is more so of like the setting that I'm in right now is in my house, in my room, um, in front of my laptop, recording a lesson. So, but then when we actually look at like a setting of a story, it's where actual events are taking place. So it's the time, it's the place, anything like that. So then next we're looking at geographical setting. So we saw that word in our objective. So a geographical setting is a setting that involves the place of where the scenes of the story take place. So if I'm writing a story and I'm the main character and I talk about how I live in Arizona and I live in the desert, then that would be the geographical setting. So it's talking about the story that involves the place it takes place. So it's me talking about how I live in Arizona. And then lastly, we're going to be talking about characterization. And so characterization was the topic of today's lesson. And characterization is the creation or construction of a fictional character. So last week and the week before, we talked all about nonfiction text, so texts that are true, that actually happen. And this week, we're going to be starting to talk about fictional text. So a fictional text is um, it's made up. It's not real characters. It's not things that actually happen. In. So it um, is just made up basically is how it is. Um, and so a characterization is creating those made up characters or those fictional characters. So let's get started and explore the book we'll be reading. All right, so the geographical setting of Esperanza Rising takes place in Mexico. So I'm curious if you have been to Mexico or maybe you or your family or friends are from Mexico. Um, on this side, I show the, um, the flag, I forgot that word, shows the flag of Mexico. And then on the right of the screen, you can see the location of Mexico. So we live in the United States, which is right above Mexico, and then there is all of the country with all of its different cities and um, just different places around Mexico. And you can see the Gulf of Mexico on it, the North Pacific Ocean, everything like that. Um, so like I said, this is the geographical setting of Esperanza Rising. Um, and so just to set the tone, I'm just curious about what you already know about Mexico, or maybe you don't know anything about Mexico. That's okay too, we're gonna be talking about it. So for me, um, one of my best friends is actually from Mexico and her, some of her family members still live in Mexico and um, so she goes there and visits a lot. And so, excuse me if I pronounce these words wrong, I'm still practicing my Spanish pronunciations. Um, but she lives in Silo, Mexico and then Pan Panjamo, Mexico. Um, or those are not where she lives, but those are the two cities where she's from and her family's from. So on the picture all the way on the left is her looking over a brick wall and some really pretty hills. And um, the next one down that picture is taken from a road and she's overlooking the city. And then we see um, some family members in the other picture and it's lots of green and trees. And underneath that, we see a building. That one got cut off a little bit, but you can see that it's a building and kind of like an open air marketplace. 
And then on the far right, you can see a treat that she really enjoys. And so it's elote, um, which is a corn treat uh, or food. And so she really enjoys eating that. So she took a picture of one that she really liked. So this is kind of one of my connections that I have with Mexico um, is that my best friend is from there. And so I've heard lots of stories. So you might have other connections with Mexico. Maybe you've seen it on TV or in movies or read about it in books, anything like that. But we're going to be learning more about it as we start Esperanza Rising. So this is the cover of Esperanza Rising. So what kind of things do you notice about this cover? So go ahead and take a couple seconds just to look at it. It has some really pretty art. So you can take a look at that. So what I notice about this cover is that I see a girl and she looks like a young girl and she has long hair that looks like it's like flowing in the wind maybe. I also see that she's in a really pretty long yellow dress. I see that she's holding two flowers. I think those look like roses maybe. And then I also see a really nice blue sky behind her. And then take a look at the very bottom of that picture. And so you can see a mountain range. I see um, some land and it looks like there's maybe flowers growing. And so I can kind of infer, kind of guess that maybe the flowers she's holding are from that land right underneath her. Um, but it also looks like the sun is rising. So what else do you notice about this picture? Maybe I see that it got an award. That's pretty cool. I see that on the bottom right. Hmm. So it looks like maybe the land that she's standing on for over, that might be the geographical setting. So we already know that this book is, um, the setting of it is in Mexico. And so that looks like it could lead to maybe something else about the geography. Yeah, I don't know. Those are all pretty good, pretty good explanations of what it is. So the genre of this book or the category of this book is historical fiction. So this gets a little bit tricky when we have history, which are true events and things that happened, but then we put fiction in front of it. And so what does historical fiction mean? So we know that history is true and that there are a lot of true events that we can find in history. But then we also see the word fiction. We know fiction means made up. So I'm going to go ahead and show you the definition. And I highlighted a couple words that really helps me understand what this means. So historical fiction is a story based on real events. So that's the history part we get is real events, real settings, and some real people. So it all sounds like the history, but also includes many imagined events and characters. So basically what that's saying is that historical fiction is based on a real event, real setting. So a real event might be something in history that actually happened. Real setting, Mexico is a real place. So we see that. Um, some real people, so maybe it'll name people who really did exist in history. We'll have to read more to find out. Um, but it also has imagined events and imagined characters. So I'll let you know now, Esperanza is an imagined character. So even though it was a true historical event, the author imagined Esperanza and her family to be the characters that took place here. So good job kind of figuring out what that definition meant. I know it's a little bit tricky, but once we start reading the book some more and seeing some more examples, it'll start to make a bit more sense. Okay, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our new novel, Esperanza Rising. And so a novel is basically just another word for like a chapter book or um, just something that's longer than like a picture book that we know. So last time we read Alexander and the No Good Terrible Day. That's not a novel, that's a picture book because a lot of it is pictures and things to look at, whereas a novel is mostly text and it has chapters and it's all just words. Sometimes there's some pictures, but um, and Esperanza Rising, I don't think there's pictures, so we'll just have to read the text. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read pages one through three. And so when I show you the next slide, you can see it by each page will pop up on the same slide. Um, so you can follow along and read with me. Um, I'm also in the learning guide going to put a link for how to read the book on your own. If you don't have access to a copy at home, that's totally fine. You don't have to go buy one. Um, I'm going to send a PDF that has the whole book as well as an audio version so you can listen to it if you prefer to listen to it instead of reading it. Or you could do both as well. But as for now, I'm just going to post it on the screen so that we can start reading together. All right, so let's start with page one. 
And like I said, I'm still practicing on my pronunciation, so I'm going to do my best, so just bear with me. Um, so this is the title of this chapter, and it says Aguas Calientes, Mexico, 1924. So we know the location and we also know the date. Our land is alive, Esperanza, said Papa, taking her small hand as they walked through the gentle slopes of the vineyard. Leafy green vines draped the arbors and the grapes were ready to drop. Esperanza was six years old and loved to walk with her papa through the winding rows, gazing up at him and watching his eyes dance with love for the land. The whole valley breathes and lives, he said, sweeping his arms around the distant mountains that guarded him. It gives us the grapes and then they welcome us. He gently touched a wild trindle that reached down into the, reached into the row as if it had been waiting to shake his hand. He picked up a handful of earth, or like uh, dirt, and he studied it. Did you know that when you lie down on the land, you can feel it breathe? That you can feel its heart beating? Poppy, I want to feel it, she said. Come. And they walked to the end of the row, page two, where the incline of the land formed a grassy swell. Papa lay down, lie down with his stomach and looked up at her, patting the ground next to him. Esperanza smoothed her dress and knelt down. Then, like a caterpillar, she slowly inched she slowly inched flat next to him, their faces looking at each other. The warm sun pressed on one of Esperanza's cheeks and the warm earth on the other. So she was like laying down like this where the sun is up here and then the ground is right here. She giggled. Shh, he said. You can only feel the earth's heartbeat when you are still and quiet. She swallowed her laughter, and after a moment, she said, I can't hear it, Poppy. Aguatete tantito y la fruta se sir en tu mano, he said. Wait a little while, and the fruit will fall into your hand. You must be patient, Esperanza. She waited and lay silent, watching Papa's eyes. And then she felt it. Softly at first, a gentle thumping, then stronger, a resounding thud, thud, thud against her body. She could hear it too, the beat rushing in her ears. Shh, shh, shh. Page three. She stared at Papa, not wanting to say a word, not wanting to lose the sound, not wanting to forget the feel of the heart of the valley. She pressed closer to the ground until her body was breathing with the earth's and with Papa's. The three hearts beating together. She smiled at Papa, not needing to talk, her eyes saying everything, and he and his smile answered hers, telling her that he knew that she had felt it. So those are the first three pages of the novel. If that was a little too fast for you how I read it, then you can go ahead and pause right now um, and just go through and read the three pages silently to yourself if you wanna read them again, um, or you can flip back and listen to me read them again as well. So first we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna reread the very first paragraph of that page. And we're also gonna notice um, what we see at the top. So at the very top of the page, we see Aguas Calientes, Mexico. So do you know what that means? Maybe you might know what that word means if you are a Spanish speaker, you understand Spanish, um, but I had to look it up and I saw that aguas meant water and calientes means hot. And so when you put it together, aguas calientes means hot water. So hot water, comma, Mexico. So when you see that comma, when it's some word, comma, and then um, a country or a place, then you know that is like, a city in that place. So we know that Aguas Calientes is her city or her town that she lives in, her village. We don't really know what it is yet, um, but it's in Mexico. So that is the first geographical setting of the book that we see. And so we also see that this book takes place in 1924. So 1924 was a long time ago. Um, and so I don't really know what 1924 was like entirely. I don't know if you do either, unless maybe your grandparents have told you about it, or your great grandparents. Um, but we're going to be learning some more about what life looked like in Mexico in the 1920s. So let's also just reread that first paragraph real quick. So I'm going to read it one more time, and you can read it along if you'd like to. 
Our, live, our land is alive, Esperanza, said Papa, taking her small hand as they walked through the gentle slopes of the vineyard. Leafy green vines draped the arbors and the grapes were ready to drop. Esperanza was six years old and loved to walk with her Papa through the winding rows, gazing up at him and watching his eyes dance with the love of the land. So when I read these first couple pages, I noticed that there were a lot of metaphors, there were a lot of similes, um, like comparing something to something else. And some of the words are a little bit tricky to understand because they're not literal. So let's look at that first sentence. It says, our life, our, <laughs> I keep on messing up. It says, our land is alive, Esperanza. So what did you think that her papa meant by that? So we do know that plants and the earth and all that, they're all living things. You have to water them, they need sunlight. Um, they create other things such as fruits and flowers and other plants. And so when he says that our land is alive, that tells us that they see their land as kind of like a breathing living thing with them. So uh, later on in, or in the first couple pages, it talks about how Esperanza and her papa laid down on the land and they felt the land's heart beating and they felt things growing and um, all of those basically just mean that they really feel like their land is living with them and that they can feel the land. And I think that shows a lot of love for the land as well, that they love it and they take care of it and the land takes care of them as well. And so we can see a lot of characterization or setting up their fictional characters about how they feel about the land that they live on. And so when I see that, they laid down next to it. And on the first page, when Papa took the earth in his hand and he felt it and they were smelling things and they were hearing things that that shows that this is their home and that this is their lives. So I also read in here that there were gentle slopes and yeah, so gentle slopes of the vineyard. So a vineyard is where grapes grow. And so grapes grow usually on like um, kind of like fences or walls and it's big vines. And it also talks about gentle slopes. And so when land slopes, it means that it kind of goes like that. Like if you ever have seen a hill, like it's hilly and it moves, but it's characterized as gentle. So they're gentle slopes. Let's see if there was anything else. Um, yeah, so we saw that our land is alive, gentle slopes, a vineyard. Um, we also see Esperanza in this being characterized by gazing up at him and watching his eyes dance for the love of the land. I really loved that um, that sentence as well, just because it shows that Esperanza is six years old, so we know that she's young, and that she loves walking with her papa, and that she loves gazing up at him and watching just how he watches the land, and his eyes were dancing with love of the land, and so it shows that his character really enjoys being there and that he is almost dancing with how much he loves it. So there was already a lot of characterization um, just in that first paragraph. So I'm excited to keep reading the book to learn some more. Okay, so another thing that we're gonna be doing in this lesson is that we wanna understand the geographic setting a little bit more. So like we talked about in the first page was that um, Esperanza, Rising, Esperanza Rising took place in Aguas Calientes, Mexico in 1924. So we're going to be doing a close read um, of a couple different readings to learn more about the geographic setting of Esperanza Rising. And so we need to understand what was going on in 1924, in the 1920s or before that. And we need to understand what the people were like and what Mexico was like and um, the different hardships of people so that we can understand the geographic setting a little bit more. So it's kind of like if someone were to ask you to describe Arizona or whatever city you live in. Um, and so, say that I was describing Tempe, Arizona, then I would be able to tell them what was going on, what I do when I go to school, what I do when I go to the movies or the grocery store. And, um, you know, if someone was coming from Florida or a totally different state on the other side of the country, they would be able to understand my geographic setting a little bit more. So if I told them about the weather or things that I like to do in Tempe, Arizona, they would understand it a bit more. If I told them about Tempe's history, anything like that, Arizona history, they would get it. So 
that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be learning a little bit more about Mexico in the 1924. All right, so we're going to be doing some guided notes together. And so here's this chart where it's the three different sections, some key points, and then questions we might have. So if you can go ahead and pause this video for about 10 minutes so that you can copy down these guided notes in your notebook. So you don't have to have all three sections right next to each other if you want to leave a little bit of room. Um, but we're just going to be doing some bullet points some questions. Um, so you won't need that much space, but just make sure that you give yourself a little bit of room. So the three sections we're going to be learning a little bit more about is Mexico, the government and the revolution, Mexico, neighbor to the north, and we're going to figure out what that means. And then Mexico, rich versus poor, which is like the rich people versus the poor people um, that were in the city at that time and what that looked like for them. Um, so if you just go ahead and make these three charts um, so that we can get started. So go ahead and pause for about 10 minutes so that you can get that set up. All right, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go through and I'm going to close out of this really quick for us. Let it load. Um, oh, didn't mean to do that. Um, so as I read, I'm going to go through and do some highlighting or I'll read it first and then I'll do some highlighting just to help us out a little bit because I know that these texts are a little bit lengthy and they might be a little hard to understand. So we're going to read them together. And then um, as we're reading and as I'm highlighting, you will pause and you'll write down your notes and then I'll show you my notes as well. Okay, does that sound good? Um, so let's go ahead and read text number one. So this one was titled Mexico, Government and Revolution. So you can go ahead and read along with me or you can just listen if you'd like to. From the years 1876 to 1880 and 1884 to 1911, Mexico was ruled by a dictator named Porfirio Diaz. In 1910, the poor and working class of class people of Mexico rebelled against the wealthy landowners in Diaz. This was called the Mexican Revolution. Workers fought for many reasons. They wanted fair pay, equal rights, and to have better opportunities for their families. The Mexican Revolution was a long and deadly war for the Mexican people, but the outcome changed much in their society. For example, the Mexican Constitution was written during this last period in 1917. This constitution outline, outlines the rules that the government must follow. It also gave all people of Mexico rights regardless of whether they were workers or they were landowners. So that's cool they created the Mexican constitution, right? They had a long list of their rights and expectations and goals almost. And so that's kind of like last week when we learned about our Declaration of Human Rights. So that's kind of a cool connection you can make. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and grab my highlighter. Sorry, one moment as I look for my highlighter. Here we go. All right, so I'm gonna go through and I'm going to highlight words that I noticed. So it gives us a time frame. So we know that it was in 1876 to 1880, 1884 to 1911. Mexico was ruled by a dictator named Porf Porfirio Diaz. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight that because that seems like some key information to know. All right, in 1910, the poor and working class people of Mexico rebelled against the wealthy landowners in Diaz. So a landowner is really just someone who owns land. So you have to have money and a good amount of money in order to own land. And not everyone had that much money. And so some people were landowners and other people worked on the land. Um, and so this is saying that the working class people, which are the people who worked on the land, um, rebelled against the landowners and the dictator Diaz. So to rebel means to kind of like fight against, try to change the norm of what was going on. Um, and we can see that later on that started the Mexican Revolution and um, the outcomes with that. I'm gonna go ahead and highlight that. Oops, sorry, it's a little bit of a different yellow. Um, so this was called the Mexican Revolution. So that sounds like it's pretty important to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight it as well. So workers fought for many reasons. So here are the reasons they fought. So they wanted fair pay, 
equal rights and have better opportunities for their families. That sounds important. So all of those details go ahead and they describe why people were fighting. The Mexican Revolution was a long and deadly war for the Mexican people, but the outcome changed much in their society. So what that sentence is saying is that when the outcome changed, that means that after the Mexican Revolution, things were different in society. Things were different in Mexico. And so, for example, one of those outcomes was the Mexican Constitution was written during this period in 1917. The Constitution outlines the rules that the government must follow. That's really important. It also gave all people of Mexico rights regardless of whether they were workers or they were landowners. That sounds really important as well. So basically what I did there is I went through and I just tried to find some key points that helped me understand what was happening from the years of 1876 to 1880 and 1984 to 1911. And so all of those details really let me understand what was going on. So we saw what was going on was that there was a dictator and that the poor and working class people of Mexico were rebelling against the wealthy landowners. And that was called the Mexican Revolution. And so the reason why the Mexican Revolution happened was because the workers wanted fair pay. So they wanted to be paid um, kind of like an equal wage or an equitable wage of how hard they were working. They were working hard, so they wanted to be paid well. They also wanted equal rights. So that means that they wanted to be um, treated fairly and that they wanted to be treated respectfully and just have rights to think the same things that the landowners did and they also wanted better opportunities for their families. So then we see that the outcome of the Mexican Revolution changed for society and it created the Mexican Constitution and that was a list of rules and it also gave people rights whether they were workers of the land or they were the owners of the land. So those are all the things that I highlight and I wrote in my tag or in my chart. Um, so go ahead and pause for about five minutes and write down your own notes right now um, and fill out that chart. All right, so at this point you should have your chart filled out. So I'm going to go ahead and show you what I wrote in my chart. So, oh, sorry, that's a little bit blurry. Um, so the section, Government and Revolution, we just read, key points. So I kind of just um, summarized what I highlighted. So we worked on this last week when we were highlighting and doing close reads but then summarizing. Um, so some of the things I wrote down was that the working class people rebelled against wealthy landowners and Diaz, who was the dictator that this event was called the Mexican Revolution, and that um, the Mexican Revolution happened because people wanted fair pay, equal rights, and more opportunities, and that then the Mexican Constitution was created and it outlined rules that the government must obey. So you might have key points that are similar to what I wrote down, or maybe they're worded a little bit differently, um, but that's okay, nothing is right or wrong. Um, but you should have understood from that that the Mexican Revolution happened because People wanted fair, uh, fair pay and equal rights and the opportunities, and that society changed after the Mexican Revolution and things got things improved with the Mexican Constitution being created. So, I wrote down one question that I still had after reading it, and so I wrote down how long is the Mexican Constitution? So, is it lots of pages? Is it like a really thick stack of pages? How long is it? And then I'm also curious about if Mexico still uses that document, or maybe if they've changed it. I don't really know. So go ahead and write down questions that you have. I'm also going to show you some pictures. So this first picture is a picture of Diaz, um, who is the dictator. And then next, these are some, um, it said on the, the, the text on the picture says, rebel soldiers in Chihuahua, Mexico. Um, and so those are soldiers who um, were working for the rebel or people who were rebelling against um, the Mexican Revolution or I'm sorry who were in the Mexican Revolution rebelling against uh, the wealthy landowners and Diaz and then this last one is this is what the original um, Mexican Constitution looked like so it was this cool red um, cover and it had that nice text on it and the picture and it says 1917 because that's when it was created. 
All right, let's go ahead and do another read of text number two. All right, so text number two was Mexico, neighbor to the north. During the Mexican-American War in 1846 to 1848, Mexico lost nearly half of its territory to the United States. Within two years, the United States had captured Mexico City and won the war. Mexico was forced to sell its northern territories, including Texas and what are now the states of California, Arizona, and New Mexico. The United States were only 18 million. That was a really low price to pay for the amount of rich land the United States was getting from Mexico. Because of this, the United States and Mexico had very bad relations for many, many years after the war. So the title, Neighbor to the North. So um, earlier when, I'll go back to it, when I showed you this picture, of this map, we saw that north of Mexico is the United States, and so neighbors of the north is the United States, neighbors of Mexico to the north. Um, so let's go ahead and highlight again for what we saw was important in this text. So the first thing is that during the Mexican-American War, so that looks like it is kind of like a new, um, a new event that I didn't know about yet. Um, and so, or that I didn't know um, yet after reading the first text. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight that. Mexico lost nearly half of its territory to the United States. So territory is the land that a country owns. And so that sentence is saying that Mexico lost nearly half of its land to the United States. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight that as well because that's important about how much was lost. Within two years, the United States had captured Mexico City and won the war. So when they say captured Mexico City, they like took over it or they seized it. And that was the end of the Mexican-American War. Mexico was forced to sell its Northern territories, including Texas and what are now the states of California, Arizona, and New Mexico to the United States. So since the United States won the war, they, uh, Mexico had to sell those territories to them for only 18 million. Now, I don't know about you, but 18 million sounds like a lot of money to me. Um, but in the text, it's saying that it was a very low price to pay for the amount of rich land. So to you and me, $18 million might sound like a lot of money, um, just because we don't walk around with $18 million. But when it comes to selling land, and it talks about the amount of rich land, so it's land that was rich in nutrients, and soil, and had a lot of opportunity for growing things, it was a really low price to pay. So uh, when we talk about context clues, that's a really good indication about um, like the worth of something. And so when it says 18 million, that was a very low price. That gives us some more context about how much that's usually worth. So we know that 18 was low. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight that this was a very low price to pay for the amount of rich land the United States was giving to Mexico. And then the last sentence, because of this, the United States and Mexico had very bad relations for many, many years after the war. So um, this is another example of why we go ahead and we get this background knowledge. So. Um, we know that our book took place in 1924, and so this all happened in 1948, um, and so we can see that, um, you know, they're not in the same time frame, but they're, you know, around the same hundred years, um, and we can see that Mexico had very, very bad relationships with the United States after that, and vice versa, the United States had bad relationships with Mexico after that, um, so that gives us a little bit of context. So I went ahead and I also highlighted that as well. So go ahead and pause for about 10 minutes to write down in your chart and also fill out the question slot. And then once you're done pausing, turn the video back on so that I can show you what I wrote in my chart. Okay, so this is the chart that I wrote. Um, so I just summarized the key points that I highlighted in the text. So the first one I wrote was that Mexico lost nearly one half of its territory to the United States during the Mexican-American War. We also saw that Mexico was forced to sell Texas and what is now California, Arizona, New Mexico to the United States. So when we say what is now California, Arizona, New Mexico, United States, um, that's just because we didn't have the names yet. Um, and so it was named something else. It could have just been like 
territory of Mexico, you know, I'm not really sure what it was named yet, um, but it wasn't named California, Arizona, New Mexico, but um, we just say that to give us some context about where it was, but Texas was named Texas, um, but in a Spanish pronunciation. And then the next one was that the United States bought this territory for a very low price. And then lastly, Mexico and the United States had very bad relations for many years after the war. So the two questions that I wrote was, why did the United States buy Mexico's territories for such a low price? That's something I was wondering. And then my other question was, did the relationship between the United States and Mexico get any better? Or I was also curious about if it did get better, what events made it get better? So those are my two questions. And then here are some pictures. Um, so this first picture, it's a little bit small, but it's showing territory line. Um, and so it's showing two different soldiers, and that is the line of territory between the United States and Mexico. And then next, this is a map that I found that um, just shows how much Mexican territory was seized by the United States. Um, so we see that it is the bottom, kind of like southern, southwest region of the United States. Um, and I liked this map to show because it doesn't say the states on it yet just because those states weren't named of course yet um, but it just gives us a really good look into how big that land was so how big of a chunk of the United States was seized by the United States from Mexico so it just gives us some context on what that looked like all right now we're going to go ahead and we are going to read um, just our last text so our last one is called Mexico rich versus poor Throughout Mexico's history, there have been small villages in the countryside. So a village is like a small community that people live in. For generations, families have lived and worked on the farms that surround these villages. So that's saying that there's like a village right here, and then the families live in those villages, but they also work on the land that surrounds it. The families who worked in the land did not own any part of the farms. This meant that they did not make very much money because they were paid low wages to work for the landowners. In fact, more than 70% of Mexico's population in the 1920s were extremely poor. Um, so what's that saying is that the people lived in the village and they worked on the land, but they didn't own the land. Um, and so in text number one, we saw that in order to own land, you have to have quite a bit of money. But these people who worked on the land, they weren't paid very well. It says they were paid low wages um, for the work that they were doing for landowners, which means that they just weren't paid fair, fair or they weren't paid very well. Um, and so in the Mexican constitution, that's why they were fighting for those rights. And that's why they were rebelling against Diaz, who was um, the dictator and they were rebelling against the government because they wanted to get paid fairly for how much they worked. And they wanted to get fairly paid fairly for how hard they worked on this land. So this is saying that 70%, um, which is a lot more than half of Mexico's population was extremely poor because of this. So we're gonna go through and we are going to highlight again so that we can see um, some key parts of this. So first part, throughout Mexico's history, there have been small villages in the countryside. So that just kind of gives us some like an introduction, some context. For generations, families have lived and worked on the farms that surrounded these villages. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight that just because it gives us some context of um, knowing that the families who lived in the villages also worked on the land around the villages. So I'm really curious about where Esperanza's family might live. Um, so I'm not sure if Esperanza, if her family owns the land or maybe they work on the land. I'm not really sure yet. So. That's going to be interesting. We're going to have to see if she lives in a village on land or if she lives away from the land. So I think that'll be something we'll learn about some more as we go on. The families who worked the land did not own any part of the farm. So I also thought that was really important <clears throat> just because we know the landowners are the ones who own the land. And this is saying that the people who worked the land did not own it. They were just paid and um, employed to work on that land. This meant that they did not make very much money because they are paid low wages to work for the landowners. That also sounded really important to me just because it explains why they didn't own the land. You know, we might be asking ourselves, well, I wonder why they didn't just buy the land. Well, 
it's because they didn't make very much money in that they were paid low wages to work on the land. So it would be hard to own something like that, you know? And then in the end, in fact, more than 70% of Mexico's population in the 1920s were extremely poor. I'm gonna go ahead and highlight that well, as well, um, just because it gives us a little bit of context. So go ahead and write down in your notes um, what you gauged from this, what key points you wanted to get. You can write down some of the things I highlighted and then make sure to write down at least one question you have as well. So go ahead and pause for about 10 minutes to go ahead and do that step. All right, so I'm gonna show you what I wrote in my notes. So for the key points, I wrote down that throughout Mexico's history, families have lived in small villages and worked in the land around the villages. These families did not own the land they worked on. The workers did not make a lot of money, and we know that was because they weren't paid very high wages. And lastly, more than 70% of Mexico's population in the 1920s um, was poor. And then for my questions, I put, why didn't these families own the land they worked on? And then my second question, I put, why didn't the workers get paid a better salary or a better wage? Those were my two questions. So go ahead and write down the questions that you saw. So this first picture, or this is actually the only picture, um, was made from Diego Riviera. And he is a super talented artist. And um, he creates these drawings of Mexico. And um, he creates drawings that are current, but then also he recreates drawings of what he thinks it looked like in the 1920s and earlier. Um, so this is just a picture that shows people working. It shows someone um, on a horse and it looks like maybe they're kind of like dictating directions towards the people. Um, let's see, I also see people doing a lot of really hard labor. And so, it, you know, someone was holding something on his back that people were reaching really high to cut things, that someone was carrying a heavy basket of what I think looks like fruit. And we also see some people in the background and it looks like they were cutting. So you can be cutting vines or cutting trees or anything trying to harvest. So I thought this was a really interesting picture. So yeah, go ahead and take a look at the picture. Any other details? I see someone in the back just lounging and taking a nap. So doesn't look like they're working very hard. So maybe that's someone who doesn't work the land. See some dogs. So yeah, I thought that was a really cool picture that just shows what was going on at this time. All right, so that was it for today's lesson. Thanks so much for bearing with me and doing that. I know that it was a little bit heavy with the text that we read, but um, I think that was really important to go through and understand what was happening in Mexico during then, what the people wanted, what they were fighting for, um, just because it's all great context as we continue reading Esperanza. So at first, your first homework assignment is to go through and read chapter one of Esperanza Rising. So we read the first three pages together. Um, so please go through and read the rest of your chapter by yourself or with someone at home. Um, and then second, you're gonna do a quick read <clears throat> of chapter two of Esperanza Rising. So we've done a close read before, which is a little bit more time consuming, where we go line by line, looking at the words, highlighting, but you're doing the complete opposite. You're gonna be doing a quick read of chapter two, just to kind of get yourself acquainted with it, um, familiar with it, kind of like an introduction to chapter two. You can also be looking out for some main ideas of chapter two or some key points that you read. Um, you can be, writing down any questions you have about chapter two, anything that's kind of confusing, but just make, just try to get like a good um, look into chapter two. And then we're gonna be doing it more together. So, but make sure you go ahead and you read chapter one of Esperanza Rising, because that'll be very important to make sure that you are prepared for our next lesson. Because we'll be going on and I'll just be assuming that you read that part already on your own. So um, make sure you go ahead and you read chapter one and then you do a quick flip through of chapter two. So thank you so much again for coming and doing this lesson with me today. And I'm so excited to see you next time. Have a great rest of your day, fifth graders.